Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to TNO with the Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, as you probably know, Mr. Mocha Lover, but escape from Robin Island amidst the chaos caused by the uprisings from the ANC and the Boers. Our national security has suffered yet another blow last night off the cope. On the coast of Cape Town, a shockingly large formation of small go-fast boats were able to bypass our searchlights and land on Robben Island. From there, the boat's passengers, a number of highly trained ANC militants, used mining explosives to blast a hole in the wall of the island's feared maximum security prison. The guards, in the middle of a shift change, were undermined and unprepared. With what with the current military situation, maybe they had already been retasked to other parts of the country. This failure to prioritize doom the rest, after a number of desperate firefights in the prison's corridors, the guards were all killed or incapacitated, and the militants could make their escape, accompanying them were a number of the island's most infamous prisoners, Govan Mbeki, Oliver Tambo, Nelson Mandela. As alarms screamed across the island, the boats made their way back to the mainland. Already there are calls in the press for an investigation into this utter failure of security. Police are blocking off major roads, but it's most likely that the escapees are already far from a grasp. How could this have happened? But the ANC revolts, which you do see over here. At approximately 0700 hours, a number of police stations in the eastern coastal city of Daban went silent. Over the course of the morning, it became clear that this was, wasn't a coincidence. Emergency broadcasts from military units in the air quickly poured in. Louis uh, Bothay Airport fallen. Uh, Both Airport. Salzburg Island under heavy assault. Ports in rebel hands. Civilian radio stations started broadcasting exhortations in Zulu and Zosa, calling on the native peoples of South Africa to rise up and overthrow their colonial overlords. Some broadcasts even noted that, with the ongoing Boer revolt, the opportunity for revolution has never been greater. Mere hours later, the few surviving security units in Durban began evacuating south as the ANC's Umkonoto. We size we declared the city to be in free African hands. Meanwhile, similar assaults have begun in other cities across the country. Clearly, our nation's crises will not be limited to the Boers. This is a disaster. Now we are at war with them. How great. Ah, we love all the wars. Also, there's one comment saying that we should do all the tree focuses. I'm not sure what tree focuses are, but the ANC has no content here. The Boer Republic has, unfortunately, no content, which I would... Wow, 50%. Jesus Christ, no wonder we can't beat them. Yeah, we're fighting one, two, three, four, five. Wait, one, two, three, four, five nations. It's a lot of nations, not gonna lie. It's a lot of nations. I hope we can do well. Um, you guys are over here. Well, you guys are just pretty much... I'm gonna just have these guys, like, surround the ANC and just, just beat the crap out of them if we possibly can. They don't get any bonuses to court defense on core territory, which is fine with us. But still. I wanna cut these guys off as fast as possible. Can you just go to Durban, maybe? I would love that if we possibly could. Please, 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 please. Keep these guys in place. You guys keep these guys in place too. Let me just move fast enough. That's all I care about. Go up there if you possibly can. Come on. Come on, big boys. Come on. I, I we did we actually we really took uh what is this? Velcron Blonfontein? Like off screen. I was able to take that. But yeah, it, it is what it is what it is. And we're our nation flames. Uh, if you want to reread that, please go right ahead. And I think I read the hidden war. So if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. Or hidden front. It's a hidden war. So Cool, but let's continue with what? Shatter the shield. Focus on counterinsurgency. Uh, beat back the invaders. I think we'll probably go ahead and do our American allies. We cannot fight this war alone, surrounded on all sides by the invading German armies. Our only hope comes from the sea. The U.S. are the only is the only country that stood out to help us in these times of great trouble, when it seems the whole world is against us and defeat is at the door. Right now in Washington, Pentagon officials are talking about an airlift to bring the most needed weapons and supplies to the Cape by American cargo planes. Those weapons arriving will greatly raise their odds of surviving the assault and make these German invaders hesitant to keep advancing. Cool. Even if we can't win right now, that's totally okay with me. I'm totally okay with that. Because I just want to circle them. I want to kill them all off. That's all we want right now. That's literally all we want. Guys only want one thing, and it's beautiful. Just to win wars, man. We just want to win our wars. The summit begins. Emissaries from the OFN member states have gathered today in Washington, D.C. to discuss the ongoing developments in South Africa. The specter of a fascismus has struck the dominion of South Africa in its moment of weakness. President Nixon said as he greeted ambassadors and ministers from five countries, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Guyana, and the West Indies Federation, at the Walter E. Washington Convention Center. We, as an alliance of democracies, are obliged to protect democracy not merely within our borders, but wherever it flourishes without. The free world cannot afford another setback like it had in Europe, Asia, Pacific 
Strike. A line must be drawn one way or another. If we must draw it across the Kalahari, then so be it. Under threat from both an insurrection and a surprise invasion by German forces in the continent, Africa's last democracy has urged the U.S. and its allies for immediate military support. The White House is expected to issue a resolution for intervention into the South African conflict into the following weeks, although details regarding the scale and participants thereof are currently unknown. The giant shifts from its slumber. We got a lot of pickle power. We still got diamonds, hopefully. We'll see. Lower worker pensions. We'll see about that. Uh, emergency weapon shipment. That'd be very nice. Wow. Oh, that looks like this is not for us. This looks like it should be go for uh, America, but okay. Oh! Oh! Yes, America, please. Oh, give us those. Oh, for the love of God. We could probably, honestly, we might be able to win without them, but let's be realistic here. Like, getting the support is of some of the highest of priority. The OFN comes for aim. We said our prayers as we held the line and the Reich crept closer to Cape Town, and at last they've been answered. By an overwhelming majority, the U.S. Congress has approved a resolution allowing President Richard Nixon to take all necessary measures to prevent further aggression from disruptive forces in southern Africa. Elements from the armed forces are swimming fast onto our shores as we speak, ready to relieve our lines and push back against the rebels and their puppet masters to the north in the meantime. Surplus and factory fresh equipment arrive at our docks in record numbers. Thousands have since crowded the harbor to greet their saviors and new allies with welcoming open arms. With the might of the free world at our back and call, the Union may yet live to not see not only the Boers crush, but fascism stained purge from a continent once and for all. So the word, the Yanks are coming. Uncle Sam's aid arrives. Thank God. Because we're still doing relatively okay-ish here, which is not great. Well, we're going to the house divided. The foreign media is often depicted the crisis in South Africa and the ensuing war against the North as a struggle between Angles and Boers and truth. As with most things, mediatic, mediatic, as more nuanced. A small minority of Boers have opposed the violent separatism of their fellow citizens. The number of those these loyalists has been growing thanks to the Boer Republic's willingness to abandon democracy and side with the northern fascists. Many of these young loyalists have joined the South African Defense Force and performed valiantly on the battlefield and the Queen's Boer Guard Unit. In turn, many Anglophone citizens are disgusted with the government's weak response to the ANC and have urged terrible retribution. At the war's outbreak, scores of fascist Anglophones have fled north to join the breakaway states or have stayed home to act as an insidious fifth column. South Africa weeps for her children. Yes, yeah, not good. It's really not good. There we go. A and C is no no matter. No matter for us. Alright, so at this point, one solid front line. There you go. We'll do the best we can, my friends. And you guys, well. You know, just go in. See what you can do. Should be slightly faster than some of them. See South Africa. In recent weeks, Americans have been treated with an unusual addition to their prime time schedule schedules standard fares. Breaks in between runs of nightly sitcoms, usually reserved for advertisements from Coca-Cola and Ford, and a hundred other sponsors and show monta montages of rolling savannas, cresting mountains, and vibrant cities from a faraway land called South Africa. Backdrop by an instrumentalized version of God Save the Queen, a grandfatherly voice soothingly extols the life of a nation few have heard, let alone seen, but that was fine, he sures. For a minute of a family's time, South Africa will visit them in their own homes, and perhaps soon they'll visit South Africa too. These advertisements are the brainchild of Edison Cook, newest chairman of the South African Broadcasting Corporation and co-founder of the nascent American South Africa Public Affairs Committee. Tasked by Cape Town to encourage closer ties between two free nations, parted only by one ocean, he has successfully negotiated airtime from each of America's countries. Big three networks for his organization's extensive public awareness campaign. Observant commentators have remarked of the concurrence between Mr. Cook's campaign and the commencement of hostilities in South Africa. Despite the veteran's broadcaster optimism and his blank check, only time will tell if the imperiled democracy's newest ploy to sway American spirit towards its defense will bear fruit. From Cape Town to the Zambezi, stretch a thousand miles of freedom. One off map, Millie. We get more out output. Oh, we lose the building worse, but for that. Oh, that's really worth it. As much as I like that, but for that's not bad. Emergency weapon shipment? This one's worth it. This one's definitely worth it. You get anti-tank and guns and manpower. That's absolutely worth it. Nice. Move up. We gotta save our soldiers as much as we possibly can. Good. Um. Hmm. I do want to take Johannesburg, but they got plus 50% attack and defense on core territory, which is insane. So, yeah, we'll see. Can you guys win here? You might be able to, actually. Can you guys win here, too? You in here too. And American allies. Cooperate with American companies. More research. Work with American companies. Purchase guns. 15,000 guns. That's really good. How many guns do we have? We actually have 2,300. Artillery is really bad. Anti-tank is god-awful. 
Yeah, we need this one next. Our nation and local arms industry might be able to support the needs of a small army fighting against an insurgency, but doesn't have the output capable to produce the quantity of weapons required to equip the number of divisions we must field to stop the invading Germans. Luckily, this is one more problem we can count on our allies in America to solve. We can be included in the Pentagon's foreign military sales program. Thousands of American-made M16 assault rifles can be delivered to us uh, immediately and go straight from their crates to the hands of our soldiers while we can, while we only start paying for them when the war is over. Well, I guess Shadow the Shield, huh? Talking with the ANC, well... I was wondering if we couldn't do some focus because we already killed them off, but okay, whatever. We want to purchase American guns next. Nice, that's not bad. It's not great, but not bad. Keeps, keep boosting it up. Keep boosting it up. What is this? Winter came spring. Alright, cool. Ah, yes. A Kimberly tragedy. Harold Howard, like his father and his father before him, was a farmer of the homestead north of Kimberley. There he grew wheat, corn, and many other crops with his wife, Laura, his daughters, Annie and Kylie, and the family's farmhands, Johan and Matisse. Farming demanded brack-breaking and routine labor from the 52-year-old father and his family. Every day in the Highveld began with work at five and ended with work at seven. But Harold saw no need for things to change anytime soon. A farmer he has been, he thought, and a farmer he will always be. But months prior to the war, Harold realized his farmlands had been returning from the weekly trip to Kimberley erratically late. Years of habit established us. He, they would have leave at 8 with a lorry full of produce, sell them to markets around the city, and come back home before lunch. Nowadays, they would return between then and sundown at the latest. Harold had a mind to ask what they had been doing, but ultimately held his peace. He trusted the Boer boys with his money for 10 years now. Why shouldn't he trust them on how they spend their time every Sunday? Harold thought life wouldn't change. He also thought that he shouldn't ask questions when he did. So imagine a surprise when Johan Anderson and Matisse Bosman returned to the farm at 8 p.m. with a lorry full of armed men. The poor man neither spoke nor wrote of the events that followed as he recuperated in the city hospital, only that he skipped by the skin of his teeth. Laura and Annie Kylie were absent from this bullet-ridden truck, except from the tails of the bush. Why are these darnable boards in their barbaric ways? <coughs> I'm not going to say they abandoned the line, but we got to be careful here, man. Yeah, just hold for now. They did not abandon Johannesburg yet, but we'll see. The Bob Hope USO Christmas Show. Good morning, Youngsfield. The crowd explodes. There's well over a thousand of them, GIs and blue suiters and their South African counterparts, spread out across a decommissioned Cape Town sports field. Young men all clad in jumpsuits and birth control glasses. They're grinning, laughing, and cla slapping their buddies on the back, and they couldn't be more afraid. That's what Bob Hope always sees on his tours. Days in and days out, there'll be a photograph taken at this moment. Hope. Dressed in slacks, a golf club in one hand like the Nixon voter he is, and a microphone on the other. A table mounted in the background, some Swedish-American beauty off to the side getting Googled, the sun shining bright over the darkest Africa. Iconic. But right now, all Bob sees is hope, or not hope, but fear. He does what he does best. He cracks one liner, pokes fun of the mess off food and the military lingo, and he makes the soldiers proud to be there. You know, he jokes, they call this place the world's biggest distributor of mesmerschmet pots. Cue from cheers from the Air Force boys. The Marines start roaring when he translates Semper Fidelis to as, Don't worry, Doc, just nail it on back. Or nail it back on. As he wears easy smiles to the crowds, he looks out at the signs some of them are holding. Hometowns, loved ones, the days they plan on getting back, some of them he knows they'll never make it that date. And Bob Hope knows that he's in Cape Town to make them forget that. For a moment he almost does. Thanks for the memory. Um, I'm gonna wait, maybe we get some terrain stuff here. I, I would like to get some terrain stuff for us. Nice, good. Goes to the jungle though. The arrival of the Australian contingent to the OFN's South African Advisor Group was treated as something of, the, of an afterthought by both American planners and their Africa Shield counterpart. Australia's small army was not expected to contribute much more than help in stabilizing the front. Its small special force command would equally be helpful in supporting American operations. This perception of men from both down and under proved entirely inadequate. Poor insurgents in conflict zones found themselves stalked by Australian commandos. African SS divisions walking into contested territories would be repelled not by the industrial might of the American bomber fleet, but by ambushes, sabotage, and misdirection. German officers that initially cursed the cowardice of the African underlings soon grew to fear the shadows where any number of Australian infantrymen might be hiding. The lessons learned by Australia in the waning days of the Pacific War and the jungles of Southeast Asia are proving their relevance to modern conflicts. Faced with a Japanese onslaught and faltering help from the UK at the time, Australian commanders learned to do more with less. Information gathering was often left to company-level officers, encouraging cooperation with local leaders. In effect, many Australian companies operate as extremely well-equipped insurgencies. Despite interest and analysis by both sides of the conflict, the strategies of the Australian army are not a panacea. Having been developed as a method to compensate for Australia's much smaller army and industry, these methods do not help the OFN much in holding vast amounts of territory, nor have the Australians found as much cooperation from the African locals than from Southeast Asians dreading Japanese troops. With the Aussies' grit and courage have finally added to the shield's misery in the sectors they share, advance Australia fair. Good, and them having them attack us is good, good, good too. 
Helps reduce their ability to fight, so. That is good. Christians for Freedom. In most Sundays, a sermon of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Savior, begins with a reading from the New Testament. The Lord's words were Thomas and granted precedent. Prescience, wisdom to any era with every reading. As the world seemed mad and decades of strife, his pleas to treat fellow men of all races and creates his brothers ring loud like gunshots for America's laity. But today was special. Before a congression of nearly 50 pious Americans, Reverend Isaiah Hickenlooper began a sermon with an allusion to Father Abraham. Brothers and sisters. Boom the reverend to his spellbound attendants. Near five score to this day, our forefathers were unchained from slavery by the fires of war. Moon and men who'd been uprooted from one continent to another had at long last met the jubilee they were promised, but even now the fiends or friends and families they had left behind remain yoked by empires, the Englishmen, the Frenchmen, and now the fascists of Nazi Germany. Short fall we may be, but we are luckier than our cousins in the dark continent. We are the pretense of rights they have not. We can send or live our whole lives without bearing the scars of whips they cannot. We are masters of our own destinies. They are not. No, my friends, they have not tasted freedom for 300 years, and they will never taste freedom for 300 more unless something is done. Reverend Hickenlooper's flock is one of the several who have organized the Christians for freedom in support of President Nixon's intent to intervene in the South African conflict. This national band of pastors and preachers have since agitated for a campaign to free German slaves in Africa, a sentiment that harkens heavily to America's own war waged against slavery. Like heavy gears made to turn, the nation's faith were aroused into a 20th century crusade by an abolitionist spirit not seen since the mid-19th. This animus manifested itself when ma Sunday Mass for a Reverend Hickenlooper's Alabama church ended with not benedictions, but with a spontaneous utterance of a jubilant tune passed from father to son. As he died to make man holy, let us die to make man free. And we still have, we do get road, well, not roads, but like diamonds. So it was worth investing in earlier. God, I wish we could invest in more stuff, but infrastructure, stationing, um, more equipment's not bad. I, well, yeah, you'll get both. Why not? Screw it. And we'll, then we'll maybe expand more diamond mines. Silence in the sky. Isaac clambered up the steep slope of what felt like the tallest dune yet. He had been struggling towards a pillar of smoke on the horizon for hours. Now it was just beyond this mountain of sand. Dragging himself over the summit revealed the wreck. A downed ME-262 fighter jet. Half buried in the sand with its left wing torn off. He smiled. This one had been just shot down. When he approached, the pilot dug at the inch-thick layer of fine desert sand surrounding the cracked cockpit dome. After what felt like an hour of digging, Isaac finally caught the pilot with him. He looked even younger than Isaac. Maybe, but he was covered in too much blood, sand, and glass to tell. Isaac shattered the cockpit with a solid kick and grabbed the poor boy from the shoulders, or by the shoulders. He barely pulled him out when he, the boy drew a sharp gasp. Isaac nearly jumped out of his boots, slipping off of the jet's wing and inadvertently tossing the Nazi under the Namib. He scrambled back up towards the de undead German. Vasa, Beta, he gasped. The South African barely had water to spare for himself. He had used up the majority of it on his trek to the Messerschmitt, and he had no interest in giving his last gulp to an SS Dradtrecker. Ignore the German for the time being and rummaged through the cockpit for supplies, two bottles of Fanta soda, but no water. He hobbled back to the Nazi and gave him one bottle, which he eagerly drank. Danke, he asked. Bist du ein Bieren und Boer? Isaac didn't speak German, but understood the Nazi well enough. Afrikaans would have to do for communication. Nee, he said. Ek is Swede Afrikaans. Uh, Sog jen cigarette? The German nodded, and Isaac handed him a lit cigarette from his own pocket pack. Gazing into the west as the sun set beneath the dune, he said, Wirst du mich toten? Isaac didn't understand him, so he shrugged. The German sighed, dragging his thumb across his throat in a cutting motion. Oh, he said, not sure of the boy's proposition. Elje hek mut? The boy definitely didn't understand those words, but he seemed to get the meaning. Oh, no schnisch, he said, shaking his head. Ich möchte zuerst den Sonnen... Zonen Untergang Beobachten. So the two boys watched the sunset over the Namib, the sky flaring into hues of orange, then red, then purple, then blue. As the stars came, the German passed, like a ripple on a silent sea. And again, the spirit of piety whispered, Why? Because you can. Who's attacking? Oh, it's the Americans. I was wondering who was attacking. Like, our guys, they're not they're not gunning for it yet. Oh, these guys are here too, huh? I'll well, kill them all then. You can, oh, the American sun tanks. Okay, that could be a lot worse. I wish they sent, you know, obviously choppers, but whatever. Yeah, I don't know if I would really want to support their attack. Sorry, America. Nice. Keep Finish that line doctrine as fast as possible. Support weapons are good to get. Let's grab some of this, too. Nice. Looking out right. It's very good. Thank God the Americans showed up. All right, they're attacking. We're going attacking too. Why not? Screw it. Ships on the horizon. On most Sundays, the sermon at Church of Jesus Christ the Savior. Oh, wait. We got this one again. Yeah, I've already read this one. This is weird. Okay, gifts from Uncle Sam. 
That's weird. Okay, well, that's okay. American training, army training. Oh, look at that. That's pretty nice. You get more attack and defense. Heck yeah. Our South African Defense Force was trained in the British School of Combat, putting great importance in entrenchment, lines of defense, unit discipline, and a, and a rigid command structure. Well, this might have worked half a century ago on the fields of Flanders. We're going to hope to defeat the modern and mobile German military with their bold lightning warfare tactics that we fight just like we did at the Somme. American trainers coming straight from the West Point Military Academy will be teaching their officers on how to fight a modern war, combine arms tactics, maneuver warfare, close air support, and modern command and control structure. And so the quicker we put our, their instructions to good use, the quicker we will win this war. A little spray. And the Marines have the SS and Boer Commandos. <coughs> and the Air Force, the Luftwaffe. Weasley haven't thought then logistics must too have an advise, adversary. So, like a genie, Africa given them one. Case in point, the flying black devils buzzing around his ear. His neck bore a landmine of red swells edging harder than gonorrhea. Whew. No use swatting them out of the sky. The red swells shaped his, like his right ear served a painful self-inflict reminder. He sighed something against the driving wheel. The motor pool was ever under attack from three adva adversaries. Boredom, heat, and mosquitoes. He'd learned to live with the first two. Now they're only something to deal with the third once and for all. West shouted G Gary Murkowski. Evans tilted his head to the side. The half-naked American moseyed towards his truck with what looked like two, spray two spray cans on his hands. What did he want this time? He asked as much as to his fellow trucker. Well, I heard you guys got a little fly infestation in these here parts. He shoved the can to a few inches away from Evans' face, so he brought these back from home. Colored him, surprised that America would prove it propose a potentially disastrous idea and how won't I and I won't keel over from spraying this under myself how Murkowski shrugged don't knock it till you try it Evan switched his gaze between the can and the American incidentally the itch on his neck flared up at the same time he bit his teeth and scratched his spot until his hands or nails dug deeper into his skin leaving behind a trail of blood the buzzing on the ears continued to taunt him that does it give me that Evan spat swiping the extra can off Murkowski's proffered hand. He pressed the release and sprayed lemon-scented aerosol on the dashboard, on the seats, and on his clothes and skin. He ran out of aerosol before he knew it, but mercy of mercies, the buzzing stopped. Wearing a wide, cap itty grin, Murkowski said, See? Told you. Evans bathed his newfound relief too much to do anything but a glance at the can that saved his life. DDT can make, said the cover in bright yellow text. I'll be honest, like, I get this is, this is supposed to be huge for us, but like, bro, how many events are we going to get? Why can't we just fight the war, man? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Guns. It's not bad. Support equipment, anti tank. We're going to need a lot of this stuff. So, we're good on guns for now ish. Artillery, anti tank, and tanks. So, we need anti tank, artillery, and we're out of PP. God dang it. Oh, prepare a covert stay behind forces. Yeah, let's do that one. Our decisions. Private Timothy Brooke counted eight other men hiding in with him in the ramshackle apartment. One lost both eyes. Uh, two carried bleeding stumps on the limbs, and four sported bullet wounds staining their khakis even with several layers of bandages plugging the bloody leaks. Doc round of the list, scurrying from one corpse to another like a uh, mother hen. A uh, first aid sling bag swayed to and fro from his side with a barren gape. The morphine bottles and gauze packs that had carried lay scattered across the cramped domicile's floor. Some of them have been administered to the corpse litter about the street corner outside. At least the Jerry's and the Bravo pasties had halted their artillery barrage hours ago. The orders from brass hours before that were simultaneously clear and vague. Hold out till, until relief. Sarge must have asked himself when they could expect relief just as shrapnel skewered into his brain into, hol into holiday decor. At least his death was relatively quick. Painless, maybe. Timothy can't say the same for the poor sods the cordsman was trying so hard to keep alive. Combat fatigue can only numb so much of the pain. So he asked the question again. Doc, his hollow voice said, put them out already. You're running out of everything. For the last time, Tim, the medic hissed. I just can't leave them out to die. They're already dead men sleeping. Just, just, just don't know it yet. None of the wounded stirred from the summer, save what's left for tomorrow. The night silence settled between him and Doc, who had slumped against the wall with both hands on his face. It stretched out for who knew how long until Doc's pop bloated, bloodshot eyes locked with his. I'll let you know, he whispered. When the moon hung overhead, seven shots broke the ruined city's fragile peace. And when sunrise brought with it a motorcade of friendlies and fresh supplies, a corpsman picked up an empty colt and thrust the pistol to its weeping owner's hands. All for nothing, Brooke. All for nothing. We are. St we still have a deficit, which is kind of insane to think about. But whatever. Guys, please stop attacking. Holy crap, we are losing here. Well, that's the case. We're going in them. They make their decisions, and we will make our own too. For the love of God, America, please help us out. Oh, I'll be. I'll be honest here. I don't like this. I don't like how we have six thousand events. Like, we haven't gone that far in time. Why? This is too much. But for as long as the sun rose and the moon set, Le Fail proposed as the nexus where so many peoples meet. The old white man of the south traded guns for Zosa wheat in the village, as did the Zulu trading their fermented milk for the strange contra contraptions of white men, new white men from the north. 
The elders had thus called their advantage in the land of blessing, but now as the two eagles of west and north waged war, the fail's blessing had become a curse. The boars came first, they took the village's goods despite their owners' protestations, cursed the savages who dared to resist, and left behind a garrison of armed men. Some left to seek red dress in a nearby town never to return. A few crept off to join their rebel brethren, taking an eye for lost tooth, but most they put, life went on. Next came the Americans, the boars fled before they arrived to save their disappointment. The new white man captured the fail's remaining soul elders for collaboration and handed out bars of chocolate. A headstrong young man dared to speak out against the captors unfair exchange, receiving a rifle butt in the face for his troubles. Some talked of fleeing to safer ground, but most stayed put. The white men will leave as they had before. Life went on. Last came the Germans. They wore black uniforms, skull cap medals, and cold faces. They took all that was left and ordered every man who carried a gun onto the village center. Old and young cowered in their huts when they heard three distinct, d three distinct sh sounds. First shouts in alien tongue, then gunshots and screaming. Days passed before the survivors emerged to gather their fathers and sons. Sapped of their strength, the survivors stayed put and slept and wept. Only the specter of famine forced them back to their farms and herds, but, but soon burnt huts were betrussed with fresh timbers. Some huts were rebelled wholesale. They all died and lay beneath their fertile earth. The boys became men, married the many women who survived with them. The fala prospered anew. The wheels turned. And that was life in the fail. But seriously, like, I get it that this is super important, but it's a bit too much, man. This is too much. We're going to seriously lose here? Oh, my God. Stop with the events. Gifts from Uncle Sam. Not all of America's gifts were purely benign, however. Hidden beneath the hustle and bustle that ensured that cr were crates devoid of the made in USA stencils borne by the majority of unladen containers. Eagle eye witnesses could spot men in the khakis of the South African Union Defense Force carrying these unmarked crates to equally unmarked warehouses. And the revelry deterred them from little from inspecting, than the glares of armed guards creating their curiosity for them instead. Inside, the crates were pried open and revealed cargo just as precious, if not more so, than cans of American food, racks of American M16s, belts of American M5... Uh, Five five six mm bullets or millimeter bullets, boxes of American radios, barrels of American mortars and bazookas. Some of the crates packed creatively dissembled American field guns and artillery. When asked, the attendants remarked only of misplaced equipment from the U.S. Navy. A scarce trickle of it, they admitted, but it'll have to do until the better channels are approved and relayed. In his apparent wisdom, President Nixon has approved clandestine measures to partly supply South Africa's wanting men with the implements they need to stem the fascist tide. Should we tell our people and the world of these gifts? No one has to know. Um. Yeah, why not? But seriously, like, this is too much. Why? Why can't we just, like, just just let us fight, man? Stop giving, me, stop giving us so many different events. Um, This is actually not their territory, so we should be able to do relatively okay against them. And since we're here, artillery now is what? Still oh, now we're out of guns. That's not good. Why is it every hour we get in another event? I'm sorry, but this has turned me against, like, playing South Africa. This is not cool, man. Like, we just want a war. But my vacation. Dare to teach you. Well, last vacation was not the way I thought it would be. On one Saturday morning, my mother woke me up early early in the morning. I argued with her. I was a wish to sleep more, but she told me to pick up my pack up my backpack and fill with clothes because Afrikaners were coming to hurt us and we must sleep. I didn't understand it, Mr. Christian from the bakery is Afrikaner and is always treating me very kindly if those Afrikaners are as nice as Mr. Christian. Why should we run from them? But then father told me she was wrong. We're not running from anyone. We're going on a train trip to the sea. The train was very crowded and many people looked very scared. Some were crying, including my mother, but my father took me to the window and sat there with me watching the view. We saw many wonderful animals, many springboks and gazelles. We even saw a lion. I had a pleasant dreams that night of, of uh, dreaming of the sea. When we arrived at the Cape, everyone was smiling. We were finally going to leave the train. I was really anxious to finally see the sea for the first time. I looked out of the window and there was a mass of people waiting for us. Maybe they would prepare a welcome party, but then a man climbed on a bench and spoke to the crowd. These kafirs won't come off in our station. And everyone started yelling and spitting at us, calling us dirty animals. I don't know why. One of them threw a rock at the train windows, hitting my face. I started crying when I saw blood on the rock. And when my father gave me a strong hug, telling me everything will be fine. At the very moment, the train started moving again and we escaped the angry people. When the train stopped, we finally arrived in the camp, my father promised us. I'd never camped before, so I was very happy, but I still have to get used to sleeping on the floor. It's so much harder than on in a bed. These were my vacations, teacher. I like camping, but I'm upset I still didn't get to go to the sea. Deal with it, kid. Deal with it. Seriously, this is too much. I'm not sure that I doubt the devs are watching, but this is just... It's too much. It's, it really is too much. How many focuses have we gone through? We're 28 minutes into this video, and we've gone through one, two... Two... Two, 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 two focuses? Three focuses? I mean, come on, that's too much. Shown on the map is our Earth split in two worlds, the free world, the slave world. The lands covered in black represent the slave world. Those in white represent the free world, our world, with the freedoms and luxuries that come with. Each torch stands for one free nation. Because of World War II, most of them lie in the Western Hemisphere. Germany, Italy, Japan have made most of the rest of their slaves. Note the long torch at the very tip of Africa, the continent right below Europe. That's South Africa. It's sole democracy. 
Once aligned within the British Empire's great pride, the South Africa is now aligned without a family to call its own. High above him, a black buzzard circle as they wait for the moment to strike. Now the ugly beasts have swooped down for the kill, but first, a glimpse of the country in question. What makes South Africa special in the concert of nations? Why must we pay attention to its plight? Though it sends as a beacon of hope amidst a continent washed or swathed in darkness, it still seems a notion for, too far or, for any American to care over much for its fortunes. For the next 50 minutes of your time, this informational film, informational film will answer your questions about the free world's last bastion in the dark continent and the perils which assail it, except excerpt from the Why We Must Fight, South Africa. The Dominion calls America answers, and please stop, stop it. Well, this one's okay, because I, I did say this when we wanted to do this one. Operation Asengai will consist in the formation, financing, arming, and training, and triggerment, assets, and covert, covert resistance activities, including assassination and political provocation and disinformation. Small-scale operations may, dis may cover discrete areas and counter subversion of hosts, but larger cells stay behind and visage, reacting to a crusader invasion of fields. Asegai or Asigai assets will be supplied with arms and explosives, cash, contents, and annex 2.a to slow down crusader troops from reaching the Cape while Torch prepares joint deployment. Understood. It's not good, man. America, we got a hole in the line. What are, the heck are you doing over here? Please stop attacking over here. I was wrong earlier. That's the thing that we do this ourselves, but you know what? Jesus Christ, America, come on. We let the AI do anything, and they just lows it up. All right. American guns. Hey, we got through three focuses. Isn't that great? We got through three focuses with like 4,000 different events. Request additional troops. Um, yeah, some okay. Focus on counterinsurgency. Morale's not back. Let's be back with the invaders. I will like to get some more war sport though. Be back with the invaders. Let's do this one first. This is our land. We cannot let the Germans take it over, and we shall not give it to them as long as there's one honest South African still standing. The Nazis and their treasonous pets at the NP think that they should conquer us, and they could conquer us. We'll prove them wrong. South Africa shall prevail with all the might of the free nations and the blood of patriotic men supporting us in our fight to the death. In the blue sky and on the deep seas, over our mountains and upon the great plains, South Africa will remain united. South Africa shall be free. Get the planes here, or the tanks here, so we can do that. Okay, What do we got here? Transport armored APCs? One man down. It was hot, humid, smelled of rotting meat, too. Private Adrian opened his eyes and his stomach lurched at what it saw. Bodies strewn about, half eaten by swarms of maggots and flies. Walls and floors stained with dark crimson splatters. A prison cell with stone gray walls and bars. Anyone there, he called out. Then his left arm stung, drawing a piercing shriek on his lips and memories from his mind. A battle with those filthy boards and the crock friends. A blast to the side, shrapnel digging into his skin, screaming in bl black and nothing else. The door swung open, as if on cue, revealing three men with batons. Hello, Adrian. One said with false cheer. Glad to see you're still awake. Chia faded from as a frown took his place, now face the wall. It went out swing, the blackjack struck Adrian's back with a resounding crack. The prisoner yelled as he slumped a bloody heap on the bloody floor. Another swing directly behind his head, and Adrian saw black again. He woke up the next day to haze on his vision and blistering sores stabbing at his very every bit of skin. Here stood on end as a baton struck the cell's iron bars. The three officers had returned, this time with a ball of pop. Smiles wise, they regarded his hobble towards a bowl. A baton swatted his hand away as it reached for the food, cracking a finger bone and drawing another bloody scream. Papped out of the blood and dirt smeared floor with a wet smack. Adrian stared in his captors and soul his eyes, his flash for mercy. The German dudes would ever never give him, like a dying mouse toyed by cats before they descended for the feast. As he slipped back into, the, into black a third time, Adrian knew he, very well that he would never leave his cell. They caught another one. I mean, I get it. Like, it's good to tell the stories and such, but, like, bros. Bros, come on. Sometimes it's a bit too much when you have too many events, like the beginning of Japan. My god. Like, if you saw my Japan campaign, you know that there's way too many events in the very beginning, which I get why there's a lot of them, but sometimes you just want to play, right? And I know this is a, you know, story-driven experience for Heart Divine 4, but my god, please. My god, please! My mother raised me proper, as she used to call it. She said it never, I'd never be like the boys who teased me at school for being from the poor end of the South Central, because I've been raised to be better than them. Funny how that changed once I joined the army, but I like to think of myself as a man of words, not of fists, at least. Not when I'm off duty. Never expected to get myself into a situation like this, at any rate. I have three siblings at home. Lord knows I've built patience for each one of them. But those South Africans? Man, I thought dealing with my own brothers was an annoyance, but when I was off duty, I swear I was more on edge than in the darn foothills. 
foothills. There ain't nothing like finding out your old man got a tighter set of lips on them than the people you're trying to help. Listen, I know you're recording to try to document this. I just want to say that I ain't trying to uh, stereotype the whole gosh darn country. It's just that they got some Uncle Tom foolery going on in there. Heck, the reason I got in scuffle, hope I held my own in there. My, my own in there, was, well, I was trying to get the light on some R&R &R in a coastal town I've been really rotated to, and I met soldiers from the 45th Battalion, S-A-A-F. I fought with them. Well, my units fought with them. For three months, I thought they'd recognize me from my tab when I hit them up for light. And you know what they told me? They pointed to the darn Zulu soldiers down the streets and told me that this part of town was, well, whites only. Darn the Afrikaans to hell. I didn't come here fighting stupid uh, lily white powder boys to get some lip from them off duty, and I don't regret what I did next either. I'm recon, remember? Learn Zulu as part of translation duties. I'm, I'm, I'm darn glad I did too. But look on those Zulu's faces. I should have lit my cigarette with that. <laughs> and they say black skins hide the heart. I never met a nice South African. Well, looks like we gotta buy more stuff here. Get some tanks. Thank you. Stand them back over. That ain't too bad, but we, we definitely gotta fight here or something. Just because this is not their core territory, so it'll be easy to beat them up. Oh my god. Uh, flight of the fact. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity, intrepidity at the action at the risk of his life and beyond and beyond above and beyond the call of duty. As a forward air controller, Captain Wilbanks was a pilot of light recon aircraft conducting patrols near Pretoria when he received a distress call from the captains Benjamin Buckley and Winjamin and William Havelock. His immediate decision to enter the proximity revealed a numerically superior hostile force poised to surround the crash site of a Huey gunship. The Boer Force, realizing that Captain Wilbanks' discovery had compromised the position and ability to launch a surprise attack immediately fired on the small aircraft with all available firepower. Meanwhile, they began encroaching upon the crash site when pinning Captains Buckley and Havelock down with small arms fire from all sides. Realizing that the air rescue elements could not arrive in time to evacuate the stranded pilots, and despite cognizance of both limitations of his lightly armed, lightly armored aircraft and the enemy's overwhelming firepower, Captain Wilbanks immediately assumed a covering close air support role. Flying through a hail of weathering fire at the treetop level, Captain Wilbanks deterred the Boer's advance first with a salvo of white phosphorus rockets, then with rifle fire from the side window of his aircraft. Despite increasingly intense anti-aircraft fire, Captain Wilbanks continued to disregard his own safety and made repeated low passes over the enemy to divert their fire away from the crash site. His daring uh, tactics allowed a rescue helicopter to successfully enter the combat zone and extract Captains Buckley and Havelock to safety. During his final courageous attack to protect the withdrawn helicopter, Captain Wilbanks was mortally wounded and his bullet-ridden aircraft crashed into Boer lines. Captain Wilbanks' magnificent action saved two fellow pilots from certain injury death. His unparalleled concerns for his fellow man and extraordinary heroism were in the highest traditions of the military service, and it reflected great credit upon himself and the U.S. Air Force. Medal of Honor Citation for Captain Hillard A. Wilbanks, USAF, a toast to Cobra 7. Please stop with the events. Please. I mean, I just want to conduct war warfare, man. Just a little bit of warfare. I kind of doubt we could actually win here first yet, so let's kind of hold for now. Let's hold. It's fine for now. Until we get another event, of course. But, um... Hmm. I want to attack Johannesburg, but we're just not strong enough. And the Americans are literally just killing their tanks off for nothing. We'll have to get the AI to help you out. Uh, let's see if we can go in here. Let's see what we can do. Nice. Not bad. American Army training. Finally got another one done. Uh, naval air support. What is this? Selling the war. Oh, look at that. That's actually really good. Beat back the invaders, right? I think this is the one we wanted to do. Nice. How many divisions are we making? Four? That's not bad. I'm going to keep it that way. we got plenty of guns, so that for now, go up to 20 combo width. We probably don't have enough support equipment for recon, so. Um, light spar is not bad. Support equipment? Yeah, we don't have enough. We definitely don't have enough, because this one requires 10, actually. Hold on. Yeah, we have enough. Let's do it. Why not? Screw it. Let's do it. And then, selling the war. That's that one. We're the only country on the continent standing against a Nazi menace. We're the only ones keeping them from overtaking Africa and putting their sights on America in one more conquest for ideology and their greed. But some parts of the American public are not happy with how the war is going and want to withdraw their forces. It's our responsibility to make them see reason. Let's start a propaganda campaign for them to know that if they bring their men home and the Germans take South Africa today, tomorrow they'll be fighting the fear as minions right on the doorstep. Nice. Pretty much. So we're at least holding. That's good. You guys are just hanging out. I would love to see if you guys could actually attack them here. Because this is, this is our own territory, so. Push them back if we can. Oh yes, expand diamond things. The Marine Raiders. Corporal Smithley is the last in his squad to climb aboard the Santa Maria under the cover of nightfall. 
He does carefully unsling his M14 rifle from his back, and as quietly as possible does a check of his loaded magazine. Ensuring a round is readily prepared within the chamber, the intent of the mission is clear. Act fast, ensure civilians are not harmed, and take prisoner as many of the hijackers as possible. As soon as the first shot is fired, the hijackers will mobilize. The squad leader gives a short series of hand signals, and then begin to move slowly across the dimly lit deck of the ship. Not long after, contact is made. The squad leader quickly releases two shots into the armed hijacker, patrolling the deck, and the hijacker goes limp. Now that the shots have been fired, the marines spring into action, shots ring out from the other side of the deck as other hijackers are likely killed. Smithley accompl accompanies his squad into climbing an outer staircase of the ship as to prepare for close quarters combat upon entering the bridge. The order is given to fix bayonets, and Smithley quickly fixes the ringed bayonet to the socket upon the barrel. Commotion can now be heard from within the ship, as several men come and begin shouting. Uh, gunshots can be heard from the other areas of the ship, as the other marine squads quickly dispatch the oddly placed and unprepared hijackers. Smithley's squad arri quickly arrives at the entrance to the bridge, from where the ship is controlled. The squad leader begins counting down the entry. Finally, the count hits one, and he springs into action along with the rest of his squad. Quickly, they rush into the bridge. Smithley, without thinking, dispatches one armed defender before a shot is fired. The other armed men within the bridge drop the right and swiftly surrender to preserve their own life. We have Galileo. The ship is secure. The Americans captured Galileo. Reports have arrived today from the U.S. Navy that the Santa Maria has been secured. A contingent of U.S. Marines aboard the USS Hermitage were able to successfully board the Santa Maria in the dock early hours of the morning. Seven hijackers were killed and no civilians or crewmen were, who were hostages upon the ship were harmed. The other 17 hijackers were captured by the U.S. Navy and placed under custody. Among those captured is Enrique Galveo, who surrendered himself to Marine forces once they swiftly stormed the bridge of the ship. The U.S. has already agreed to extradite the Iberian hijackers to be dealt with by their legal system. The Americans, after questioning Galveo, have discovered his intentions. The intent of the hijacking was to sail the ship to Portugal, where intended to incite rebellion within Iberia. A modern Don, or oh, Don, I think it's Don Quixote, or Quixote, however you pronounce it, whatever. We're trying to take Johannes, Johannesburg right now, but Brazil's 100 days, very cool. And something else there too, oh, hello. Oh, look at that. Um, you guys, you probably can't help out, which sucks, but whatever. Come on, take Johannesburg, and actually, finally, even though we had the event earlier, Australia finally decided to send some guys over to here. So, it is what it is. Uh, there's another comment saying that, you know what, even though we're still in the war, we should continue to oppress minorities. You know, we'll do the best we can here. I promise you that. We'll try to do the absolute best we can, but there are no promises. Beat back the invaders. Um, what should I do? Selling the war? Yeah, I was selling the war, yeah. You can read that, please go right ahead. Two extra damage a month, so nice, so nice, my friends. Uh, more political power is also very good too. Purchase American guns. Oh, oh, the U.S. doesn't have any guns. Well, that sucks. Um, yeah, we got tw ten diamonds. Not bad. What else do we need here? Guns, support equipment, motorized APCs. Well, we're looking pretty good on guns. We need artillery. That's really the main thing we need. So we gotta wait for that one. Let's go ahead and do American tech, American technological supports, Army XP land doctrine. Cast would be very nice. Traditional troops. Even more weekly map would be pretty good. Increase the conscription. Yeah, I don't know about that for now. Oh, look at this. <clears throat> all terrain training. Our boys have to be taught to do battle in all sorts of terrain. They must be ready to meet the enemy in the deserts, jungles, hills, mountains, and rivers of the continent. But we must not depend on them alone, for their officers will too have to learn how to lead them, lead them onward. Let's ensure that our generals are competent enough to challenge a German invader wherever they may be. Oh, yes, please. And artillery pieces, thank you. Supply chain and reinforcement, very good. And with some, some more diamonds, develop cape. Another diamond every month? Sounds good to me. What does a guy like in his life? He likes a lot of diamonds. Well, maybe not, maybe not, no, well, maybe not that, but you know, whatever. And more infantry weapons, very good. Give us some time to relax, and let's grab some of this. Better anti-tank. Ooh, a little bit of lag, that's okay. Oh, that's, ooh, that's a bone we want. Cool. All right, I don't know what the Americans are up to, but like, it, they're just, they're just being dumb right now. They're just straight up being dumb. Get Praetoria. I'm just trying to capatch, capatch? Capitulate these guys as fast as possible first. I mean, that's just literally all we're trying to do. Do we need more anti-tank? I said, do we... No, no, actually we're good. We're actually really good on anti-tank. We need some more support equipment, though. If we could get some support equipment, that'd be great. 300 units is not a lot, but you know what? We'll take it. Praetorias are too. We got it, my friends. The Battle of Johannesburg. Um, I think I've read this one before, so yeah, the war goes on. If we don't read about this, please go ahead. Nice. I've got half their equipment as well. Oh, jolly good. Jolly, jolly good. And circle them as fast as you possibly can. And kill them off. Nice. Very good. Very, 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 very good. And uh, as you see, the Australian tanks here too. Nice. Good stuff, everyone. Good stuff. 
Selling them the war, the warriors of the north. Volunteers and supplies from over, all over the world have been filling our ports to aid us in our holy struggle to hold off the Nazi hordes. Most of these nations we have expected, such as the OFN, who of course have been waiting for this for years. Others we were, we were less prepared for, such as aid from the officially neutral India, hedging its bets, as always, for German or German allied Brittany. But the least expected of them all has been recently shown up and unannounced at the HQ of 1 SAI on the front. After nearly getting into a firefight with the first sentries, 100 Russians, along with, ironically enough, guides and escorts from Central Africa hired via Breton connections, claimed to hail from various warlord states from the Sover former Soviet Union, approached the base commander and immediately offered their services. The volunteers claimed to belong to the all Russian volunteer anti Nazi League, a ragtag militia claiming allegiance to over a dozen different Russian states from the famous West Russian Revolutionary Front, all the way to devotee to a man claiming to be the King of Rurik and the Far East. While most of them do not speak English, or a leader, leader claiming to, to belong to some sort of paramilitary organization called the Guard has informed the commander in heavily broken English that the 100 fighters can institute a mix of volunteers sent by various governments and men wishing to fight the Germans for personal reasons, and will fight harder than any other man, having been trained for nearly three weeks in a Guard reg regime. We're not going to turn away brave uh, fighting men, find a place for them immediately. They'd be better served telling someone what the heck is going on up there. I'll go with that one. That's fine with us. Finish them off. Are you kidding me? Go in there. Nice. Alright, so everyone else, you're going to hold and just now reform your line. So here, that's actually really good. We can go this way. I'm going to cut these guys off first. Because at this point, we just got to look for encirclements. Hopefully, the Americans can just go blitz through these people. But trying to get the Americans to do this might be a little tough. Just saying. God, I want to use more diamonds, man. Just get more diamonds. Diamonds are a guy's best friend, as some might say. Then again, I don't buy rocks like that. Charles Frazier? Oh, yeah, be offensive, please. Nice. Let's go in. I still don't want to do a general attack, because that's just too risky for us. But I'm going to circle another motorized division. That'd be great. And there we go. Nice. Let's go in. Nice. Good stuff, my friends. Good stuff. Develop Bayesian Roads. Spend diamond mines. Oh, yes. I love the diamonds. It's going to hurt our ability to, like, garrison in a lot of salt areas, but whatever. You know, it is what it is. Um, actually, you know what? Let's go up the top one. Let's go up here. Bing, bong, bong. Something like that, you know. Ost Africana booby traps detonated Maputo. Recent reports from the front state that our successful capture of Maputo has been dampened with widespread cases of sabotage. Our forces report various items and areas have been mined or booby-trapped, including enemy weapons, homes, and their own dead and wounded, including our own in extreme cases. This is extremely disturbing and has caused several casualties and deaths amongst our forces. From a strategic standpoint, the larger concern is that the Ost African force seems to be attempting to destroy any usable infrastructure as they retreat in an attempt to delay our advance. Bridges have been blown over various rivers. Roads and trails have been mined, especially the common dirt ones that may, one may find in Ost Africa and the few paved roads are usually cratered. This scorched earth tactic has been a major part of Ost African defensive strategy, says intelligence. By depriving the South African army of anything useful, they helped to eventually slow and choke off the attack, leaving our forces vulnerable to a counterattack to change the path of the war. The infrastructure destruction is not a tactic of desperation. According to intelligence, rather they believe the area around Maputo has been mined since before the war. Regardless, we are moving engineers and bridging units to the area to fix the infrastructure. Our anti-mine units and bomb squads are attempting to defuse any other booby traps that have yet to be detonated. The men are still in good spirits, so and we plan to continue to push the enemy back and keep them there. Nice. Iberia uh, offers assistance in South Africa. If you want to read about this, I think this looks like the exact same one as we got before, so if you want to read about this, please go ahead. We'll take all the help we can get. Just because there's just so, so many flipping events. It's ridiculous. It's it's too much. It's too much. It really is. But, you know, whatever. Lower worker pensions. We can still do that. I don't, know. I don't want her I, I don't want her poverty, though. Like, I want more stuff, but still. Build the Sao Tome Air Base. Sao Tome and Principe are calm under developed backwater off the coast of the Iberian Guinea. At least until the Iberians came to an agreement with us to use it as a refueling and supply station from the Sensem. It's been a vital stop for the transport ships and warships alike, in addition to its close proximity to relaxed commissar at Zensor Africa, allowing for reconnaissance and covert operations behind enemy lines to expand. That's really good, yeah. APCs. I mean, we don't have that many tanks. You know what? We could probably use APCs. We don't use that many, right? One is 13 tanks. It would give our guys a little slightly more fighting push if we put them on there, so. How much does it require for these armored divisions? Oh, let's go over here. Oh, we have. Hmm. Hmm. 
There you go. It's the only eight combo with, but whatever. The Golden Cup. The blood and sand of South Africa's front lines lend themselves poorly to the amenities that the free world is taking for granted. Three full course meals, air conditioning, vacation leave, these fruits of prosperity once banal have become luxuries as soon as half of South Africa rebelled in the Reich rumble, rumble to war. While well, plenty remains have been reserved for guns, tanks, and ammo for 10, 000, 10 million bass and bells. For a nation under siege, blooders indulge in excessive bass and treason are worse. Of course, that does not mean special occasions no longer warrant. Uh, a bit of celebration under the current stresses, far from it. What it does imply, however, is that Her Majesty's the Queen's most loyal soldiers need only the humble tea kettle and some special ingredients to commemorate the day of her birth. <clears throat> Papers were exchanged among the quartermasters beforehand, such that their well-oiled trucks delivered crates of twinings, or twinings, twinings, and creamy milk rather than rifle rounds and oil to Commonwealth formations across the front. More specific requests varied among the realms. The Canadians, for instance, ordered an extra bag of English breakfast for every beaver in uniform. West India men detachments asked for generators to power their fancy ice boxes for brewing cold tea. The Anzacs demanded gallons of the freshest Norco Cape Town receives from the antipods. South Africa's asked for medical supplies and spare parts to kill joys. Then again, they accepted the honey bush bags as eagerly as they do bottles of betatine or better time yet in spite of their myriad differences and quarrels regiments heckled each other and themselves over whether to add milk before the tea or the converse every last commonwealth tar listened to the earl cameron announcing the queen's 36th birthday on cbc radio and when Her Majesty's speech ended with the first crescendo of an old story tune crackling from their old ham radios, and a battle brotherhood of nations raised their cups into the air in unison as they shouted, God save the Queen! Thank God I'm an American. Woo! Weird. Um. Can they do this one? But. Um, if you want to read this, please go right ahead. So, I think I've read this one before. So, oh, great boost of the war effort. Uh, thanks, I guess. Are these so. Why are you slower than these guys, man? They detonate in Gaza. A recent reports from the front line or state that the cap successful capture of Gaza has been dampened with widespread cases of sabotage. Oh, okay, I didn't realize this was a different one. So if you want to read this, please go right ahead. Well, you hold. You go in here. You're going to hold these guys in place and you're going to cut their heads off. Just saying, man. Yeah, these. Why are you guys so slow? Nothing but nonsense. Would you look at that? Would you look at that, you son of a rock sucker? Technological innovation, uh, women in the workplace. Eh, it seems okay. Focus on counterinsurgency. The problem of Hatsog's henchmen terrorizing our countryside and harassing our supply lines is becoming more serious than it was previously expected. It seems that just the SAP and Army MP units, coupled with light infantry formations, are not just enough to rip the problem in the bud, but we need something more. With the help of our American allies, we will form the Civil Operations and Revolutionary Development Support Program, Codename Cords, a special project with the aim of not only finding and eliminating the armed MP insurgents, but also quashing their political organizations and turning the rural Afrikaner population from terrorism enablers into loyal subjects of Her Majesty. You know, since we're here, what do we also got here? Uh, tanks. Yeah, definitely get some more tanks. Followed up with... And pacification mass-produced propaganda. Hatzog's NP has betrayed you. For years, they applauded the funneling illegal weapons across the borders, inciting domestic revolts, and refusing to participate in elections. Surely they were scared that the people would reject their cowardly ideas. Now against all hot and reason, they have pounced. We must not stand idly by. Our home will never be simply another Rex Commissariat. South Africa's vast natural beauty, as well as its splendor, belongs to all Afrikaners. Not a decrepit tyrant in Germania, or a traitor's cancer tolerate for far too long. For our homes, families, we must fight into our dying breath. The Dominion, a last bastion of continental liberty, must survive. Messages such as these are being mass-produced to raise morale amongst both civilian and military communities. Good. Very good. Weird, we're at war, but with no debt. It's kind of weird, man. Not gonna lie, kind of weird. Nice. If we have to take these guys out one by one, then so flippin' be it. Nice job, guys. Oh, we got some more stuff here. Do we get some? Yep, it's the first of the month. Uh, roads? Stationing? Uh, that's not bad. Owns Orange Free State. Do we not own Orange Free State? Where should we own that? I'm not gonna lie. But whatever. Oh, okay, do that one. Well, no, I guess technically we don't. Whatever. A thousand more guns. Get some more infrastructure. Why 
What I want us to do is do something like that. Wee. I guess something like that. Something kind of wacky and weird. There we go. <coughs> go the long way around if you possibly can. I know I'm completely ignoring the left side here, but whatever. It is what it is. Um. Oh, there goes Tricky Deck. Goodbye, Tricky Deck. Focus on jungle fighting. Oh. Go jungle. Ah, give them all. Go grab that too, because you can. Or just go right there. That would also be very helpful. Go, guys. Go, go, go. At least right now, there's less events. My god, it was just way too many earlier. That really pissed me off. I'm like, guys. Like, I get it. It's a narrative story. And, you know, narrative-driven mod, but why? All the time, man. All the time. Byra, clear the main. Will be very good to get grab. Yay! Good job, guys. Because this helps extend their division counts, so we can come down to Ramelstadt, and hopefully encircle two more divisions too. And Masvango, Masvingo. All right, we have a lot. I mean, that's a lot of guys. That's a lot of guys. We've killed off a lot of enemies though, which is really great. Guys, I'm trying to make an encirclement. It's better for them to die in an encirclement than what you're doing right now. God dang it. Don't kill them off too fast. Here's from the sky. The streets run red with bloods of innocence as bombs and mortars rain from the sky. Despite American air superiority, little can be done with the enemy so close by. Civilians of South Africa find themselves inadvertently caught in the crossfire of this bloody, bloody conflict, and as a result, many become a casualty of war. In the chaos of the city streets, many speak of Portuguese saviors who run through the deadly corridors, rescuing those in need. These stores, while they may appear to be fantastical, are in fact grounded in reality. Accounts from both... Across the conflict in South Africa, tell Portuguese medics of the Iberian army coming to the aid of those in peril, risking their own lives and limb to do so. Hundreds of South Africans claim to have been, in one, some way, rescued by these medics, operating far outside the scope of their mission in order to provide any assistance possible for the South African populace caught in zones of conflict. The actions of these men have truly become the make of legend. We are forever in their debt. Let's find everyone we can, huh? Find everyone we can. Uh, bring the Americans in. Well, can't do that one. Courage detection defections? Not bad. Aim for pacification. South Africa is an enormous country, and our vast rural areas have unfortunately become the hideouts of the National Party's commandos. Armed bands of men fanatics enough to murder our, queen's, our own Queen supporters would also take care to face our army in open battle, but the, for their shelter will not be safe for long. We'll find their hiding places using long-range patrol groups who will be able to stay for days in the bush until coming into contact with the enemy. When the enemy is located, he is quickly surrounded from all sides by air mobile infantry brought by helicopters to prevent them from being escaping before the American Air Force pounds them with incendiary bombs and a final infantry sweep to take care of any survivors. When we start applying this new tactic nicknamed the Fire Force, by our officers in a large scale, any board commando that is located by our scouts is, is as good as illuminated. I'll be honest, like, playing this, like, I kind of want to just, like, play Vicky 2, but like, plays like the Boars. That sounds like a lot of, that sounds really difficult, but that sounds like a lot of fun. I think I'll try that off in my own, uh, my own time, but, like, I didn't do very well. <laughs> I don't think I did very well at all. But that sounds like a lot of fun. Nice. All right, so I mean, if the Americans and Australians decided to push like as hard as they possibly could, we could probably do really well. But they're probably not going to do that. Go in if you can, boys and girls. Oh yes, the cool main uprising, and the war goes on. I think I've read this one before as well. So if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. Not bad. The Battle of Salisbury. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. We're doing very well right now. Maybe too well. Trading ships in Bissau. If you want to read about that, please go ahead. Sure, why not? Use Portuguese maps to guide airstrikes. Not bad. Psychological operations, yes. And request Iberian doctors and nurses. Why not? We have the PP for it. Why not? Right? Grab both of those. And anything for... Oh, yes. Yes, more diamond mines. We can actually just go right there. I would love if we could just go right there. And then do... Boom. Or we could go here, too. I just want to circle them, man. They provide map for the war effort. Oh, oh, there goes JFK. Um, I think I read about this one as before. So, if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. Yeah, we hit the Luanda airfield stuff. And goodbye. The goal is encirclements. You know, they're looking very quite weak in some of these divisions. Just go here. <coughs> 
Because I want to get over to this ghost and just encircle and kill them all off. But, you know, that's just me, maybe. Switch it our lines just a little bit more. That's okay. The Luanda Arms Factors. If you want to read about that, please go right ahead. Nice, nice, nice. Goebbelstadt, huh? That'd be really cool. Goebbelstadt. Sounds like a fun place to be. God dang it. I wanted to encircle them and kill them off or whatever. They want to concentrate their soldiers, so be it. You know, they're allowed to. Night vision is nice, 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 nice. We don't have that much stability, do we? No, we do not. Fine, at least we can finally just, just play this stupid war. That's all I wanted, man, earlier on. But they might wouldn't let us. Ah. Train our troops in Bissau. Ah, Radio Africa Livre. Officers working at the SOG HQ in Cape Town were not believing their own eyes when they first glanced at the so-called specials that arrived from Iberia. Rather than the clean-cut military men in well-ironed uniforms that they were used to. The Portuguese specials had long hair, mustaches, and wore war floral shirts instead of camouflage. Small groups gossip in the hallways about how the Iberians looked more like folk singers than real soldiers. And they were right. These men, all of them, spent at least a decade living in the continent. These were part were part of the joint project to set up a Radio Free Africa, who would broadcast propaganda in Portuguese aimed at African natives in Angola and Mozambique, trying to inspire them to sabotage the German warfare. But more powerful than the propaganda were the songs, most popular being Canto do Desertor, an anti-war ballad written by Angolan-born poet Luis Celia, calling for desertion as a moral th thing. Reinforced feelings of nostalgia for home and family and the futility of it dying in a war for those who are oppressing your people. The popularity of Celia's songs proved so much among the Sudwest African SS that their German officers ordered the confiscation of personal radios and started punishing soldiers who tuned in on RFA's frequency. But no matter how harsh repression is, in every sector of the Namibian front you can hear their troops humming the, while their officers are away. Medram uma cruz de ferro quando matai meru irmão e acabo promovu me o alemão I'm sorry, I can't read this. Todos me chaman de heroi ningem. You see what it is. Tell my mother I won't go to war for a German. Heroes from the sky. The streets run red. I've read this one before. Yeah, we've read this one before. Wait. We are forever in their debt. Rex Commissariat Ost Africa gets. This still seems a little bugged. I'll be honest. This seems a little bugged still. Hmm. Well, it is what it is, I guess. Nice. Mass produced propaganda. We love mass produced propaganda. All I gotta get to is one more there and aim for pacification. Yeah. Let's follow it up with what? American talent. Our American allies have something interesting proposals to bring to the table. They think that the war's course can be turned against the Nazis if we put in to use these innovative tactics. They say that conducting raids into enemy territory and deploying highly trained soldiers in small units to achieve unconventional objectives, creative uses of our ships to interdict German logistics and innovative employments of the Air Force, it was on hard ground. Let's consider what our friends have to say. And I want to encircle these guys. Get, just, just, get, just get it done. Just get, come on. Come on. Yay, we got him. Go. 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 Go in. Because now the war is looking very good for us, which is really weird to say, but whatever. Oh, they want to actually... Four divisions. That's pretty nice, actually. Diamond mines? You say diamond mines? I say why not? Infinite diamonds! Actually, you guys go here. You don't worry about that. You, you hang out. Very nice. Stuckler wins in Austin, or whatever it is. So be it. Buy guns, ask for more stationing. And then, empty tank is very good. And. So I think we'll have probably one more episode after this, just so we can win the war here. Because it's looking pretty darn good already. Obviously, we're not playing on hard mode, but if you enjoyed this video so far, Leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will hopefully win the war and save the Union of South Africa. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.